I invite you to stand as you are able as we hear from Scripture. The gospel this evening is from Matthew chapter 20, beginning with the first verse. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, at about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those, who hired, were those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So I'm sure most of you have heard this story a whole bunch of times, right? And when we hear this story, at least in my experience, we usually talk about or hear about God's justice and fairness and how God's justice is not always like our justice because God's perspective is very different from ours or things like, you know, we need to not be petty like the laborers and argue about, you know, who gets more and who gets less and, you know, things like that. But I think there's more to this story than just that. So I want to take a different kind of viewpoint of it. For me, this story is more about being splintered and divided instead of whole and being unified and having healthy relationships. So this landowner is doing what he believes he has the right to do with what belongs to him, which is what he says in the story, but that includes people too. Because for him, people are just another disposable thing to be used at his discretion until they're not needed anymore. So he hired those laborers, and he felt like he could do whatever he wanted to them because he was the landowner. He was the one with the power. This landowner's apparent graciousness and justice at the end of the story are, in fact, viciousness in disguise, I think. He's been generous, yes, but only with a few of the laborers, and in a way that intentionally causes envy and division. And it was definitely intentional. He intentionally paid the last laborers first, so that the ones hired in the morning would see what he did. He could have easily paid the ones he hired first, first, (laughs) and they would have never known the difference. They would have never known anything about what anybody else got paid. But he didn't do that. He intentionally caused trouble. He intentionally flaunted his power and his status in the community. And he certainly made sure the laborers knew their status and their lack of power. He's caused division among the laborers too, making them think in terms of us versus them. They were no longer unified as laborers all just looking for work for the day. 
they're now divided and separated based on what the landowner did. Now, we can argue about whether they should have reacted the way they did and all of that, but again, I don't think that's the point of the story. I also don't think that we should equate this landowner with God. Because does God typically cause division or unity? God creates unity, right? He doesn't cause division. So why do we often hear this story interpreted as if the landowner represents God? Is it because the landowner is the only one with power in the story? One theologian asks, why do we so often think that the power figures in these stories, whether they're kings or landowners or fathers, represent divine authority? And why do we believe the same about powerful people today? I think this scholar has a good point. It seems like so many of the powerful people in our country and around the world are like this landowner, treating people like any other commodity as something to be used at their convenience and, and to be used however they want. They cause division instead of unity. Somehow we've lost this idea of us together as one body of Christ, as, as God's people. And we've become this world divided into us versus them. When we only focus on our differences instead of the things that we do have in common. And not only do we see our differences, the people with power amplify those differences and make them seem insurmountable. Or that we're so different that we're, we have to vilify and hate those who are different from us in any way. We forget that we are all God's children, we are all created in the image of God, and we are all loved and cherished by God. I, think, I also think that Jesus told this story because he knew that his disciples were struggling with the same idea of unity. If you look at the stories in the Gospels, the disciples argued with each other a lot. <laughs> they argued about who was the greatest among them. They argued about who would sit at Jesus' right hand. And then they were divided and separated when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Rather than being unified in Christ and unified as Jesus' disciples, they were broken and divided at different times in their ministry and in their lives. So when we try to see the world as us versus them, we're left with division and broken relationships. Another aspect of this story that I actually hadn't thought of was something that uh, Pastor Brian Stoffergen talks about. He said he was having a group discussion about this story. And he found that most of us identify with the laborers who were hired first. So we assume we would be the ones hired first, and then, of course, we're angry and upset and resentful about those who are hired later and get paid the same. But he said some in his group identified with those who were hired last. There are those in our midst who assume that nobody would pick them. And it reminded me so much of the trauma when I was in elementary school. And I don't know if they still do this or not. Maybe you guys can tell me. When you're in gym class or FIED or whatever you call it here, <laughs> and you're lined up and, and you have somebody choosing teams, and you're waiting for your name to be called, and it doesn't get called and it doesn't get called. When I was in elementary school, I was always, always the last person chosen. <laughs> because I had no athletic ability and nobody wanted me on their team. It was horrible. Do they do that here? Maybe they've banned that. I hope so, because that was horrible. Or, I mean, maybe you've been one of those in the playground that, you know, you're, play, you're hanging out by yourself and no one's hanging out with you at that time, and it's lonely. This pastor says, some people live their whole lives like that. Some people live their whole lives waiting for someone to notice them and to notice their need. Maybe this landowner 
didn't see these, these other laborers all the times he went back to the marketplace because they were invisible to him. So he asks, who are the invisible people in our church and in our community? Who are the ones that we don't see or we choose not to see? And then how do we extend God's invitation of love to them? So how do we see them as one of us instead of one of them? And how do we create unity instead of division? Especially, again, in our communities, in our country, in the world, where division is not only encouraged, but it's celebrated. I think we all do need to take a hard look at what we do and say that may cause division, because I think we all do it, myself included. I'm not innocent of that either, because it's such an easy trap to fall into. I mean, how many of us have heard or said things like, if they really wanted to work, they could find a job. Or if they would stop drinking, they wouldn't be homeless. Or they are all terrorists. Or if they would stop being so aggressive, they wouldn't get arrested more often than us white people. We could go on and on with those things that I've heard, things that I've said, I'm ashamed to say. (laughs) But none of those things bring unity, do they? How many of them are the ones who feel invisible to us, who do have more power and privilege? But also, how many of us sitting here right now have been the ones who feel invisible? How many of us have felt worthless at some point in our lives? I know I have at different times in my life, and that's a horrible, horrible feeling. But when you're feeling invisible invisible and vulnerable and worthless, how amazing does it feel when someone sees you Jesus, throughout his ministry, saw all those invisible and vulnerable people in the community where he was that the rest of the culture said were worthless. He saw them, and he loved them, and he saved them. They became part of his unified whole of his disciples and his followers that we are also part of. And then, of course, we are called to do the same thing. To see those who are pushed to the margins of society, who are invisible and vulnerable, who are seen as different and not worthy of love and welcome. Reach out and truly see and embrace all people who our community and our country and the world doesn't want to see or only sees as them or worthless. And we can name all those groups too, the poor the refugee, the addict, the Native American, the African American, those in the LGBTQ community, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative. I mean, the labels go on and on and on of all the ways that we separate each other and divide each other. So do any of you know the mission statement of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church? And you are not allowed to answer. (laughs) Anybody? Don't feel bad. Nobody in any of the services knew. So (laughs) that says a lot about us, and we need to teach that a little bit better, right? (laughs) The mission statement of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, it's on the top of your bulletins, by the way, is to share the shepherd's love with all of God's children. So the mission statement of this congregation is to share the shepherd's love with all of God's children. Our call and our mission and our ministry together in Christ's name is to remember that we are all God's children. We were all created in the image of God and we are all loved and cherished by God. And when we embrace and live out that call and that mission, we do become a unified us of all of God's children. 
There will be no more them, no more labels, no more people who feel worthless, no more invisible and vulnerable ones. We'll only be one unified us together, beloved children loved and saved by Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.